What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about one of my personal very favorite subjects. If you've watched some of my other videos, you know that I'm particularly fascinated by bands who are hated or misunderstood when they came out. And then over time, we kind of look back and we go, you know what? Actually, wow, those guys were onto something. They were just too far ahead of the curve for us to get it, but in hindsight, they were right. And you may think that I'm crazy for saying it, but I think one of the very best examples of that is Good Charlotte, a band that was absolutely despised at the time back when they came out as being industry plant, fake punk garbage for teeny boppers who shop at the mall or whatever people say about bands like that. But in hindsight, actually, they were way smarter than I think any of us, including me, realized. And you might be saying, wait a minute, are you saying that Good Charlotte of all bands were actually playing 4D chess back in 2002 while the rest of us were just playing checkers? That they were actually five steps ahead of all the haters, including me? And yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. They predicted the whole current wave of pop punk meets streetwear meets hip hop culture over 15 years before it became basically the default lifestyle for anybody with a face tattoo. They were sneaking minor threat into MTV songs back in 2002. And they're actually still influencing culture in ways that I think a lot of people don't really realize. So what exactly did they know that the rest of us didn't? And what is the lasting impact and legacy of Good Charlotte? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. Also, I am now on Twitch. I'm streaming twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I also have a Discord that's up to over 4,000 members now. And there's links to both of those things in the description of this video. But first, I want to thank Soundcore for sponsoring this video. They sent me their Liberty 3 Pro earbuds, which I've been using to listen to music at the gym or going for walks or whatever. And I have to say, I am really liking them so far. They claim to have the best sound with active noise canceling among true wireless earbuds, thanks to their patented ACAA 2.0 technology. And they're endorsed by 20 Grammy winning audio producers. It's all built around their latest coaxial driver technology and a more immersive sound experience. So you really feel like you're surrounded by a full 360 degrees of sound. You can dial in customized EQs using the Soundcore app and you'll get up to 32 hours of playtime with the charging case. And they also use their unique Hear ID technology, which delivers the best active noise canceling for any earbuds in the under $300 range. And you'll also get this like really nicely designed charging case. It's just so satisfying to open and close it. So if you want to check out the Liberty 3 Pro earbuds, just hit the link in the description of this video. And in order to understand Good Charlotte, I think we've got to go back to the beginning. They started back in 1996 in Waldorf, Maryland. Waldorf, Naptown, worldwide. Which is about 25 miles away from Washington, D.C. And as far as I can tell, it's just kind of a pretty unremarkable suburb. Which is actually kind of an important part of understanding who Good Charlotte is. I think of them as one of the first bands to start kind of in the wave of that mid-90s punk explosion. When bands like Green Day, The Offspring, Rancid, and No Doubt, all of which were bands with legitimate roots in like the DIY punk scene, back when all of them blew up and put punk on the radar of kids in places like Waldorf, Maryland, who weren't part of the underground scene and really had no way of even knowing that it existed because remember, this is before the internet, at least as far as we know it. I thought this kind of said it well. I found out about a lot of my influences through newer bands, says Benji, like The Clash, The Sex Pistols, Minor Threat. I didn't know who they were until I started listening to Rancid. Then I'd read any Rancid interview I could find to find out what they liked, and then I'd go out and buy it. And that's really how 99% of us were. Again, this is before the internet. So if you were just like a relatively normal kid from the suburbs, this is how you discovered punk. You can say they were posers if you want, but the reality is most of us did discover punk from MTV. I I did, and they never pretended to be anything other than that, which I think was a big part of their appeal. They weren't trying to be cooler than you or flex their punk cred or whatever. They just were who they were. And so kids didn't feel like they had to pass some sort of intimidating, annoying punk credibility test to be a fan. The band was just super relatable. I think the song Little Things is a perfect example of that, which was their first single that really put them on the map. And 
And if you're the typical suburban mall punk kid with divorced parents who grew up kind of poor, but like not in the hood or anything, and you just kind of felt like a misfit loser that kind of didn't really fit in anywhere, you listen to that song and you really felt it. Even me, you know, I was 21 when this came out, so I was a little bit older than their target audience. And I mostly thought they were kind of corny at the time, but that's exactly how I grew up. And listening to those lyrics, I couldn't help but relate to it. And so it became kind of a guilty pleasure song for me. And I think that same perspective is also what framed their ambitions for the band in general. Because one of my biggest frustrations with the quote unquote real punk scene is that any kind of success is almost like actively discouraged. Like the worst possible sin you could make in the eyes of those people is to make some money. But because Good Charlotte wasn't from the quote unquote real punk scene, they didn't have any of those like dumb self-limiting beliefs. And so they really wanted to be big from day one. This is a old interview with the program director at their local radio station. This is the radio station who put on the festival that the Good Charlotte Song Festival song is about. And here is what he said. Benji once told me they wanted to be a combination of the Backstreet Boys and Minor Threat. And I thought this quote was really interesting because that is exactly what they seemed like to me when they came out. There was like the street punk guy, the goth guy, the skater guy, and the kind of normal guy. Just how every member of a boy band had kind of their own persona and corresponding fan demographic. Like, oh, I like AJ, he's the bad boy. And I have no idea whether it was intentional or not that they sort of had those personas. Although knowing now how smart they were in hindsight, it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was on purpose. Either way, what I really love is that they were ambitious from the very beginning. That they weren't afraid to say, yeah, you know what? We want to be famous. We want to reach the biggest possible audience that we can. We want to have the most influence that we can. And yes, we would like to make some money. So anyhow, their first album was the one that put them on the map, especially that song, Little Things. But the second album was the one that really blew them up and also what revealed kind of how big their vision for the band actually was. And in particular, the song that really made Good Charlotte into what they are today was the song Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. which really was the realization of their vision of being like the Backstreet Boys meets Minor Threat, like in very literal terms, because the video has cameos from Chris Kirkpatrick of NSYNC and Mike Watt of the Minutemen. So it's like literally exactly that. Although personally, I always thought this part was the highlight of the video. Isn't it true that the accused treated you like a dog? <laughs> And this song was a true mainstream success. Like you would hear them playing this at like the junior section of Macy's or whatever. And this is really what put them in the same league as bands like Blink and Sum 41. But the one song in particular that I want to highlight here is the anthem. Oh, what I'm saying is this is the anthem for all your hands up. which in hindsight was really, really ahead of the curve in a lot of ways. First of all, it's just like a legitimately great song, which again, transcended just kind of rock and made its way to mainstream radio and really cemented their status as being more than just a pop punk band. But it's the video that really piqued my interest. The thing that immediately stands out to me is that it has a surprising amount of what I guess you would call street culture in it. Like the lowrider bikes and the guys with face tattoos. There's a few little subtle references to hardcore, like the minor threat line. I'm just a minor threat, so pay no mind. And remember, this is way, 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 way before you saw people with face tattoos anywhere, especially in the context of a pop punk band. So that alone was pretty shocking. But what really surprised me is to see Benji wearing a Vietnam shirt. They kind of tried to blur it out, but there's a couple frames where you can make it out here. Vietnam is a pretty obscure New York hardcore band, kind of loosely related to the whole like mad ball sort of world. Very, very legit. Like this is a super deep reference. And then on top of all that, you've got Joel wearing a Fendi tracksuit, which again, nobody, absolutely nobody was doing this in kind of the pop punk warp tour kind of world at that time. They also did a song with Pharrell's Project N.E.R.D. around then, and they did a collab with Bape in 2003. Apparently, Nigo was a big fan of the band. And if you're a younger person watching this, it might be hard to understand how advanced all that was, because all of that stuff is fairly unremarkable by today's standards. But remember, this was 20 years ago. Pop punk, 
cyberpunk, face tattoos, rap, hardcore, and like luxury fashion, these things did not cross paths at all, like whatsoever back then. These days, of course, it's a different story. You know, you go on Instagram and there's like 10 million face tattoo pop punk rappers and Balenciaga sweaters, but it was a very different world back in 2002. I remember seeing this and just being like, what in the fuck are these guys doing? This makes no sense. You can't put all that stuff together. And obviously in hindsight, those things go together just fine. It's just, they were 15 years ahead of the curve. And then there's also girls and boys. Girls don't like boys, girls like cards and money. Which was their third single in a row off this album to really cross over into that kind of mainstream radio territory. That is an extremely impressive run for one album. And if that was like the peak of the band right there, I'd say that still would have been super respectable if this was the best they ever did. But it wasn't. In 2004, they put out their next album, The Chronicles of Life and Death, which debuted at number three on Billboard. And it was a lot darker than their other albums. I'm more of a pop punk guy, so I didn't personally like this album as much but I do think it was really well done and it was just kind of an important thing for them to do because it showed that they could do more than just that like early 2000s TRL style of pop punk that was starting to kind of show its age and become less cool as the newer emo bands like from first to last started coming on the scene and kind of moving the culture on to the next thing. And this is also around the time when it really started to become apparent that the guys in the band had a lot more depth than just dudes in a pop punk band. Their guitarist Billy Martin did the cover art for the album. He also co-directed the video and did the set design for the first single, Predictable, which had a lot of that Nightmare Before Christmas, Tim Burton kind of aesthetic that was starting to really blow up in the mid-2000s. So I knew something and that is what opened the door to a whole other second career for him. I actually had no idea about this until pretty recently, but he's actually a really accomplished artist who's done stuff for like huge clients like Nickelodeon. He's done a whole bunch of covers for Marvel Comics. I mean, the dude's legit. And in parallel to that, the Madden Brothers had also rebooted their clothing brand made as a new thing called DCMA. And they certainly weren't the only guys in the pop punk world with a clothing brand. The guys from Simple Plan had Role Model. And of course, the Blink guys had Famous Stars and Straps, Atticus and Macbeth. But what was really notable to me is that DCMA took things in a much like grittier streetwear kind of direction with more like graffiti and Southern California street kind of imagery as compared to most of those other brands who I'd say are more aligned with like Quicksilver, Fox, Hurley, and that kind of thing. So this was another example of where Good Charlotte was sort of drawing from hip hop and streetwear kind of worlds and bringing that together with pop punk. And again, this is like standard stuff now, but it was not the case back then. Like this was many years before any Anybody even used the term streetwear. And as far as I'm aware, they shut down DCMA a couple years ago, but still it's clear that they saw this trend coming. The fusion of skateboarding, rap, streetwear, punk, and metal that really blew up around like 2017 or so when brands like Vetmont took over high fashion and kind of pop punk in general. Am I saying that they walked so ASAP Rocky could run? No, not exactly, but still you gotta give them some credit for being like 10 solid years ahead of the curve on that one. Travis Barker, obviously has to be mentioned there as well, but they were very early too. And I think you have to give them credit for being way ahead of the curve on this stuff since the very beginning. Like they were talking about being influenced by Cash Money and Lil Wayne and stuff back in the 90s. They've got that little nod to Nas in Little Things. We're talking about BAPE and YSL in 2007. Maybe I'm just dumb and uncultured. Maybe everyone else knew about this stuff and I didn't, but I really don't think anybody in their audience knew about that stuff at all back then. You carry the old bags and you got your Chanel. You wear Louis Vuitton, HG, and YSL. Now I got baby Nate. I got DCMA. And all of that stuff is cool, but what really made me a fan of Good Charlotte is around this time, Benji and Joel were on Loveline. That's the radio show with Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew. They do like relationship advice. And you know, for better or for worse, that's kind of where I learned how to be an adult in a lot of ways, because I grew up, you know, with your typical broken family, divorced parents. I don't know my father. My mom was married like four times. You know, I realized I didn't really have a blueprint or any guidance on how to be like a healthy, <laughs> successful human capable 
capable of having like normal relationships. And Loveline is where I learned a lot of that. I really have to give that show credit for a lot of what and who I am now. And when I heard Benji and Joel on the show, they basically kind of said the same thing. And it was clear to me that they were taking it really seriously. A lot of people just go on there and like promote their album and make dick jokes or whatever, but they really tried to help the callers. They talked about their dad leaving. They did their very best to give the callers like legitimately good advice. I heard what they said and it made me kind of flip the switch and go, okay, these guys are a little bit more insightful and thoughtful than your average band guys. And it feels like they're kind of on the same journey that I am of realizing that you have to kind of make your own blueprint for personal development. Which brings us to their next album, Good Morning Revival from 2007, which hit number seven on Billboard. That is their third album in a row to hit the Billboard top 10. And that album's got more of like a dance punk, post-punk kind of flavor. And if you've watched my other videos, then you know my feelings on that stuff. I'm not the biggest fan. So this album isn't my favorite, but I do think it's very well done. And again, showed that they could do more than one style and do it very well. Basically, every album was almost like a different band, but it still sounded like Good Charlotte. And that's really tough to do. With that said, I do like the song Keep Your Hands Off My Girl. That one held up very well. I thought it was cool to see them collab with Avenge Sevenfold on The River. Again, kind of reaching outside the genre boundaries of what you would expect for them. And again, showing that they had a sense of like understanding the kind of artists that they wanted to hitch their wagon to as far as collaborating with other people that were consistently ahead of the curve like Avenged Sevenfold. And then in 2010, they put out Cardiology, which is interesting to me because there's nothing at all wrong with that album. Like objectively, it's very well done. I couldn't really point to anything about it that's like bad in any way, but it kind of just doesn't really do anything for me. Maybe that's just because I was a lot older when it came out and you know, I'm at a different point in my life. So maybe it just hit me differently, but I think there's a little bit more to it than that as well. Like I'm not gonna say that they phoned it in or that it was like inauthentic, but I think maybe there is some of that. This is what Benji had to say about it. In a very genuine way, we really wanted to make people happy. We wanted approval, the label, the industry, the last couple of records we were making for other people, not for ourselves. We were trying to have a hit so people would say good job. And so to make a long story short, it kind of felt like the band had just sort of run its course, like they'd sort of done everything that they felt like they could do with it at the time. And so they went on a hiatus for a while and then came back with two albums that I think are very well done. They feel as close as you could expect to the old good Charlotte from guys who were, you know, 15 or 20 years older, which is a fact that they seem very aware of. And I actually really appreciate that because it's tough seeing people kind of trying to be something that they no longer are. And so at this point, it seems like they're just kind of trying to have fun with it rather than trying to recapture the glory days or whatever. And if you ask me, that's the way to do it. Kind of like what Fred Durst has been doing lately. Which brings us to the last section. What is the lasting impact and legacy of Good Charlotte? The first part, of course, is that they were one of the very biggest bands of the 2000s that got millions and millions of kids into music, into like punk, hardcore, or metal, whatever. They'll never admit it, but you know that there's some dude out there in a leftover crack shirt with face tattoos, spare changing on a corner somewhere, whose introduction to the world of punk was from Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. I also think that along with AFI and Fall Out Boy, they actually did kind of a lot for putting real DIY underground hardcore into the mainstream spotlight. They got minor threat lyrics and Vietnam shirts onto MTV. They also signed Freddie Madball's side project, Hazel. Hazen Street to their label DC Flag. And of course, speaking of Hazen Street, you've also got to mention New Far and Glory in there, but collectively, you know, all those bands really did a lot to put hardcore into the mainstream spotlight, which to me is a good thing. Other people may feel differently, but to me, anything that can get more people into the culture is a good thing. And let's be real, in a lot of ways, they kind of invented the entire identity and lifestyle of every like cool guy, face tattooed, emo, pop punk rapper. I would say that arguably more than anybody else, they really kind of paved the way for Lil Peep and all the people that came after him. And I think part of the reason why they seem to not really feel a lot of pressure as a band and are able to kind of just do what they want is because they all have so many different fulfilling things going on in their life besides just Good Charlotte. Billy has his art. Benji and Joel have a management company called MDDN where they work with artists like Architects, Sleeping with Sirens, Water Parks, Poppy, Dwayne, like all the artists kind of moving their respective genre forward and probably quite a few other projects that I'm not even aware of. These guys have their hands in a lot of cool stuff. 
So if you haven't, go put the Young and the Hopeless on repeat and put some respect on Good Charlotte's name. All right, my friends, that does it for this video about Good Charlotte. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Check me out on Discord and Twitch. Pick up one of my Pop Punk with Breakdown shirts if you haven't. There's a link to all of those things in the description of this video. And as always, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get access to every podcast that I do a week early. There's members only channels in the Discord that I'm super active in. I do Q and A's. I do giveaways. There's a way to have me review your music or artwork or anything else that you want to get my eyes and ears on live on Twitch. So if any of that sounds cool to you, just check that out at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.